Welcome back, Marissa. Thanks for having me. Marissa has been to the Most Powerful Women's Summit many times. As many of you recall, last year, Marissa was not here because McAllister Bogue was born the day before the Women's Summit started last year. It's true, it was an eventful Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, so now, now Marissa is, it's kind of amazing. You are number eight on the Most Powerful Women's Summit. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're number one on our 40 under 40 list, which came out a few weeks ago. And you're a Fortune 500 CEO. That's the trifecta. It, yeah, it was interesting. Andy had sent me a note saying there's an interesting trifecta about to happen. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's flattering. Um, but I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with Yahoo and the opportunity that's there. It, it has had. We, we would not have put you at number eight on the most powerful women list or at number one on 40 under 40 if the turnaround at Yahoo, Yahoo so far, and I realize that it's a work in progress, but it does appear at this point to be for real. The stock is up over 100% since Marissa started in the job in July 2012. <laughs> And I think most of the people in this audience know that this is after a whole lot of smart people tried to turn Yahoo around. And this has happened under a CEO who actually had never, had never run a P&L before in her career at Google. Not, that's not true. <laughs> Explain that, because I've, I've actually said that in stories. OK. <laughs> and correct me. Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, Google was organized functionally, but, but we had P&L. So I mean, the, the real P&L is for the P&L for the company. But inside of, inside of Google, the different product groups have P&Ls. And so your local and location business that you were running at Google until you were recruited for the Yahoo job in 2012, you actually had a, a P&L that you were judged on. OK, good yes. to have that correction. Good yeah. to have that <laughs> So you had never run a, certainly never run a public company. You had, no. you know, you had joined, you had joined Google when it was very, very tiny. I remember you telling me about Sergey and Larry interviewing you over a ping pong table yep. in a makeshift mm -hmm. office. And she had, you know, like 13 job possibilities, or yeah, I'm not sure well, how was, many. It was the height of the first boom. Right. So it was 1999. It was a good year to be a graduate in computer science. So Google was the only place you worked. But what have you, what have you really had to learn on the job at Yahoo? What has been the, the steepest learning curve? I think you know a fellow, a fellow CEO said to me that the interesting thing about being CEO that's really striking is exact, that you have very few decisions that you need to make and you need to make them absolutely perfectly. And, and his point really was that you can delegate a lot of the decisions, but you, there are a few decisions, and there are sometimes it's not obvious, that you need to really watch and that, you, that can really influence the outcome. And that's something, watching for those decisions every day, wondering to yourself, is this one of them? Or is this one where you know, it doesn't really matter what the decision ends up being? So if you had to name, and I'm gonna ask you to name, three decisions that you have made that are the most important in the 15, 16 months since you've been CEO, what are they? Uh, I think that the company's commitment to mobile is probably the biggest one. Uh, it sounds funny, but when I got there, we were still issuing Blackberries to every, to every uh, employee. Blackberry is a great product and really useful, but I think that Yahoo's future is going to be rooted in mobile apps. And we know that we need to have apps on some of the core platforms. And so iOS and Android, probably the two most important platforms for us. We obviously have And you gave free smartphones to everybody in the company. Right. I mean, they're, they're, the company issues smartphones. But, but it was really important for people to be able to experience our products. We call it, uh, we call it dog fooding, where people you know, try the products and give us feedback. Dog on fooding. Them, like, as an eat your own dog food, right? So we, <laughs> we make the stuff, and then we, then we use it every day. And so I think that was really, really important. I think that, you know, and I'll, I'll just group them as a set of decisions, but the collective decisions around the team. And for me, the team is incredibly uh, important. And so everything from getting the right people in as CMO, and I actually met my CMO, Kathy Savitt, at this conference, uh, I think, two years ago. 
um, but bringing in you know, Kathy is my CMO, Jackie Reese is our Chief Development Officer, Ken is my CFO, Enrique is my COO, and then tremendous product leads. Um, as well as getting the company recruiting again. Year to date, we've hired 1,000 engineers. Uh, we've hired, uh, and I think now we're, we're edging up above 60 uh, world-class computer science PhDs as we rebuild Yahoo Labs, that's incredibly important. Um, and then Marissa reported earnings the other day, and uh, you know, kudos to you for getting here. I mean, you jumped on a plane after you reported earnings, so thank you for that. And I think you said in the earnings report that you uh, got 17,000 resumes in the last quarter. We did. We actually we celebrated in September because we were like, well, we got 12,000 resumes, which is basically a resume for every single person who works at Yahoo. Which basically means that's how in demand it is that we get a resume for every job that we have. Uh, in the company each week, and then we see also have seen a spike since then, all the way up to 17,000. And that's up from 2,000 in January. So we've seen an 8x increase in the number of people who want to come and work at Yahoo, which is just tremendous. So one more decision. What's, what's the third important decision? I think the, the third important decision um, is probably Tumblr. I think mm -hmm. that the decision to do a large acquisition that's not yet accretive, uh, but overall it was re is a really big bet. Uh, in terms of what's happening with that platform, what's happening with creative expression on the web, uh, and how people are going to choose to connect and express themselves in the future. So Tumblr is the largest of your 24 acquisitions that you've made. 1.1 billion at, was the cost of the acquisition. What is your overall strategy with in terms of your acquisition strategy, and why Tumblr? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think each, each acquisition has its own story uh, as to why we've done it. There have been some that have been pure talent acquisitions. Um, Stamped was our first acquisition, a group of 10 people. It was someone I had known uh, previously and was running a great company. They were doing this kind of four square for things where you checked in and punched the things that you liked. Uh, had had a great run of it, had a, lot, had a fair number of users, but it just really hadn't hit the tipping point that they had wanted it to hit. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I said, okay, you're a great group of 10 people. You know how to design mobile apps. You know how to build mobile apps. Their app was beautifully designed. And I said, would you mind you know, abandoning your app and coming here and working on something different? Hmm. Uh, and you know, that was a really hard decision for that team, but they ultimately decided that they would do it. They're like, we like working together. It is true our application hasn't really gone where it's supposed to go. Um, and in terms of users, we're happy with where we are, but we you know we, we're not going to be Facebook, Twitter, or Foursquare. And so they decided to stop working on what they were doing, and they came to Yahoo and built the mobile versions of Yahoo Screen. So, so that's, just, an ex that's a good example of an a true aqua hire. Or a we call them talent acquisitions. Okay. But, yeah, but the, the idea there is you know, they came in, they built a beautiful, bizarre new video platform that we launched in September. Uh, it's got one of the nicest p players in the industry. And it really has, it has Saturday Night Live, Comedy Central, all kinds of great clips, NBC Sports. Uh, so really excited about Yahoo Screen, and that wouldn't have happened. But we literally took the team and said, okay, all 10 of you, come over here, recruit your friends. They actually recruited their friends. They're now up to like 20 or 25, and, and build the mobile version of our video application. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're in New York, and they did a great job. So there's a talent acquisition. We've also seen talent acquisitions with uh, technology attached. So we bought a company called Sumly, uh, got a lot of attention because the founder is 17 years old, and so we literally have to call his mother and ask him sometimes for permission for things. <laughs> and is um, he still based in England? He's based in England, but he comes to Silicon Valley a lot. Um, and so he was a talent acquisition. It's funny because he came in, uh, his summarization technology, you know, we looked at him and we were like, is it for real? His what technology? Summarization technology. What is that? So he takes long form content and summarizes it down. Uh, which is perfect for mobile. So on Yahoo, we have lots of articles, we have lots of content. We need to summarize them and, and get it on the phone, uh, summarize the articles and get them on phones. And we looked, they, someone came and I was like, really, are we really gonna buy? I think at the time it was 16 year old, I was like the 16 year old's company. And we literally rolled out Yahoo Labs, got our best uh, artificial intelligence engineers uh, and, and scientists on it. They looked at more than a dozen summarization companies around the world. And they were like, honestly, it's legit. His is the best. It's based on technology from SRI. Uh, and he had worked with a great, he had assembled this, in, this group of engineers from all over the world to work on this technology that he had managed to license out of SRI. And he did a great job. But we, we brought that in. Within three weeks, we had it integrated into the Yahoo app on phones. Uh -huh. 
So we, I mean, I think it's the fastest integration I've ever seen of an, of an acquisition. And now Nick is working on all kinds of interesting projects all over the company, which is, and is just he, tremendous. Is he in school? He's in school. Is he in high school? He's in high school. <laughs> so the funny thing is, like, people were really upset when we bought it because they said, well, what is this business about the founder leaving in 18 months? And we were like, well, he's got to go to college. <laughs> I'm like, maybe he'll still intern and stick around. And I think he will. Yeah, he's having a good time. But uh, he's having a good time. He's been a great contributor so far. But so, we are going to have to take some time for, to let him go in and get his education. <laughs> so Tumblr, I mean, here's another case of a, of a company that was started by a guy, really young age, David Karp. How did you come, what was the, what, what's the, what was the big, Selling point on Tumblr, why Tumblr, and what have you learned from David Karp? Sure. Um, so I think that Tumblr, when we looked at it, there were, it was almost, you know, I love maps. I worked a lot on maps um, when I was at Google. And if you looked at Tumblr and Yahoo, you know when you look at a map and you can see the way that South America and Africa used to fit together? I, I sort of joked that, like, as we got to know Tumblr, we were like, it kind of, we kind of felt like those continents. <laughs> Like, uh -huh. our users were older, their users were younger. We're really good at n hard news, sports, and finance. They're great at art, architecture, travel, food, right? They, I mean, it was just really amazing um, in terms of, of how the companies overall really fit together. They needed great search and great discovery. We had that. What we need is great content. So th they really fit together nicely, and there were a lot of obvious things that, that just came together. And David will talk about Tumblr both as the home, home of the world's creators, which is a mission that we really, really loved, um, but also as a home for brands. Uh, this notion that on Tumblr, you know, a lot of people host their websites there, both brands, like The Daily Show has their entire blog on, on Tumblr as a, as a publishing platform. But it's also a place where people just go and post, for example, their art portfolio or their blog for the day. And so it's really interesting. There's, there's new brands, people who are trying to build themselves up as online personalities. There's also all kinds of brand, interesting brand expression going on there. But David Karp is just incredibly special. Um, he's, I, you know, I, I like to think that I'm good at empathy, but I will say that David Karp is just incredibly empathetic and really uh, in tune with the community of people that he has that are contributing and creating on Tumblr. And he has a certain respect for that community in that he does not want advertising on his site, and yet. He, he does, that, that's not true. <laughs> that's he wants as he wants advertising that's, that's, that adds to the user experience. How are you but gonna it, monetize Tumblr? Uh, I think that the, we have, we have a, a set of ideas and they actually have, or they are accepting advertisements today. Okay. Um, and they've been doing, they've been working on monetization now for about three quarters. Okay. So they're just getting it started, but it's a great platform and we have a lot of advertiser interest because the platform is so expressive and does allow for such creative ideas. I know, for example, when the game, when the movie The Hunger Games came out, uh, they actually published, there's a lot of fashion on Tumblr. They published a fashion blog of ca called Capital Couture, of like what the different people in the in the movie wore, just to sort of be you know at, 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 um, really participate in the community on the subject matter that they care a lot about. And so it's really interesting to see how brands are using it to build interesting offline content that that adds to the overall message. Uh, Marissa, I want to talk about culture. I want to talk about a couple of the building blocks of um, your challenge to transform the culture at Yahoo. Um, you've made a number of big changes, and the challenge is not only aligning, what is it, 13,000 people? 12. 12,000 people, but aligning 12,000 people who were pretty demoralized when you came in. And um, aligning 12,000 people who are absorbing people from 24 acquisitions. So what are a couple of those building blocks, those things you've changed to transform the culture? Well, I think I'll start off with an overall philosophy, and actually two of them. Um, you know, Eric Schmidt from Google is one of, my, one of my favorite mentors, and Eric would always say this very humbling thing uh, that's really true, which is he, sa he would say, good executives confuse themselves when they convince themselves that they actually do things. <laughs> And he was like, look, it's your job as leadership 
to be defense, not offense, hmm. right? The team decides we're running in this direction and it's your job to clear the path, get things out of the way, get the obstacles out of the way, make it fast to make decisions and let them run as far and fast as you possibly can. And I think that when I came in, people were like, well, what's our strategy now? And I was like, I don't know, you tell me. Like, I, I know you've been here longer than I have and they were like, Really, like we get to give our ideas? No one's asked, I mean, I literally had some employees say, no one's ever asked us for our ideas before. Uh, and you know, it was really clear, and, and like, there was a lot of pent up energy. People were like, is it, is it time to go now? Are we ready to go? Um, you know, I think that was really important. And I think I've always thought of culture um, as DNA. I don't know a lot about genetics, but I understand some of it. And I think that what you really want are the genes that are positive to hyper-express themselves in culture. Mm -hmm. Take the elements of fun, take the elements that are really motivating and inspiring people and amplify them and ramp them up. Mm -hmm. And take some of the negative genes that are getting in the way and shut them off and find the, and you know, figure out what's causing those and, and, and shut them off. It's not about injecting new mutant DNA, mm -hmm. right? It's not about changing the culture, it's about making the culture the best version of itself and so, it's so everything from, you know, one of the things Yahoo's really ex has always excelled in is content generation. Uh, one of the things it's always really excelled at is technology and really helping to build the strength there is something that, that I'm excited about. But I also think that to some extent the, the negative expression of the, of the DNA is when you see, hey, things are getting in people's way. How can you turn some of, that, some of those off? So how do you facilitate those good genes to operate better? And how do you clear the path? I mean, one of the things that you've changed, I know, is goal setting in the company. Explain that. Well, there's goal setting. We've also done things like quarterly calibration. But one of the things, it sounds funny, but when I first got there, everyone said to me, oh, there's a thousand things you need to fix. And I, I mean, it's really overwhelming when people come up and say that to you because you know, you're like, how am I gonna fix a thousand things? And so we came up with this idea, we have a moderator tool where people can vote on things. And we came up with the, we were like, well, there's process in the way, there's bureaucracy in the way, there's just stuff kind of jamming up the system. And people would come to us and they say, you know, I know the answer, I know the solution, I just need someone to tell me it's okay to do it. And we'd be like, by all means, it's okay, please do it. And we said, well, how can we harness that energy and we came up with this uh, process called PB&J, Process Bureaucracy and Jams, where you can go and you can write up something that's just getting in the way in the company. It could be big, like, you know, my laptop is woefully underpowered for the job that I'm being asked to do, because we end up refreshing everyone's laptops and getting all new, all new equipment in that way. But, um, or it could be small. It could be like, why does the gym ask us to have orientation when like every hotel in the world just lets you go and stand on a treadmill without a learning session? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, they, people started doing this and then other people come and vote on it. Uh -huh. And if something gets more than 50 yes votes, we sit down uh, with the member of e-staff, executive staff, that it would be the person who oversees it, and they clean out their, their PB&J on a quarterly basis that has more than 50 votes. And PB&J just turned a year old in September. It's been completely embraced by the culture because people just love reporting these things that are kind of in the way and kind of annoying them. And this notion that if you report it and it gets enough votes, it's gonna get fixed, it's gonna get addressed, um, really empowers people. They finished a thousand things wow. in the first year. And I joked, I mean, I told this joke at our, at our all team on Friday and I said, you know, like it's so funny because all of you came up to me and said, there's a thousand things to fix. And the truth is there are thousands of things to fix. We're not done. But, but I was like, wow, like they fixed a thousand things. In and the how do year. they? Some big, some small, but it's really, really amazing. And how are, and how are people held accountable for fixing those things that get more than 50 votes? Because they, we, one is there. So everyone can see, hey, like this is on the top of your PB&J list. So there's this real transparency, there's real public accountability for it. But the other thing is we have a small team of five or six people that work on PB&J. Uh, and so they go and meet with the teams. But, those five or six people can't do a thousand things. The real testimony and the real learning lesson here is that by empowering people in the company to fix what they knew was broken, they're like, oh, are we fixing things? Are we changing things? Because like, I've got some stuff I want to fix. I've got some stuff I want to change. And they really grabbed, grabbed the opportunity. That's great. 
Our time is supposedly up, but you know what? <laughs> we hold the power here. And uh, we're going to take two questions from the audience. Um, who has a question for Marissa? Yes. Identify yourself, please. Uh, can we have another mic? Uh, is that working? Hi, I'm Adina Friedman, the CFO of the Carlisle Group. And one of the more controversial decisions that made the press, at least, that you made, that you decided on was the issue of uh, flex time and working from home. And it's interesting because at our firm, we have the opposite problem. There's a bit of a culture of if you're not here, you're not working. And as, and as I've had a younger and younger um, group of employees, and frankly, a little bit of a mini baby boom, um, it's creating issues with work-life balance. So I'd like to try to understand what was your rationale for, what was the actual decision? Because it may have gotten blown out of proportion. Mm. Um, what was your rationale in your, in your attention, and are you still happy you did it? Sure. Um, so our, our rationale is that this is Yahoo's all hands on deck moment. And I fully accept, a lot of people have said, well, wait, people are more productive when they work on their own. And I, I fully accept that. But what they aren't is more collaborative. And when you need to innovate, you need collaboration. And so when I look at things like Yahoo's weather app, which I hope a lot of people have on their phones, um, you know, I think that what you see there is our weather team met up with the Flickr team. And they said, Flickr said, we've got all these geotagged photos. And the weather team said, you know, we need to make weather beautiful. And they brought it together. And now you see these postcards of beautiful photography from all over the world when you look at the weather of the actual weather pattern that you're seeing in that city that day. It's really quite remarkable. But that wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, that happened because two people ran into each other in the break room and got to talking. That doesn't happen when you're by yourself uh, in the kitchen. But I think that, so I, I think that the collaboration piece is really what ultimately motivated it for us. I think it did get blown out of proportion. I think, um, you know, I've been told, I try to sort of avoid and, and stay blind to some of the, the media here, but the, um, just in general, uh, but the, I think that what got blown out of proportion was people felt like it was a very gender charged decision. Uh, and in truth, it was about 100 people in the company, so it was reasonably small, and actually 80 to 85% of them were men. And so it really didn't, it wasn't something that it affected a lot of women. But the thing that we really wanted to get our hands around was the notion of the official work from homers. And by the way, we made a, we made a fair number of exceptions for exactly the work-life balance reasons that, that you note. Um, we made, so we made a fair amount of exceptions, but I think that the other piece was there were a lot of people who would just choose to stay home on a Tuesday or on a Friday for whatever reasons, good, good, good life reasons, but the issue is when you have that happening in mass, it does, it does hurt overall productivity. Uh, and so, because I actually think that the, the, the person who stays home, I know for me, like when I stay home to wait for the cable guy, like I'm half as productive as I would have been in the office for that same period of time. And so we really wanted not only to you know, work with the folks who are, origin who, are, who are officially from working from home, but also some of the unofficial time because we really wanted to pull the energy into, uh, into the business. Another question for Marissa? OK, I'll ask the last question. Um, Ursula Burns was just talking about transparency right before us, and you've done something interesting. You had you had your you reported earnings on Tuesday, and you are now doing video earnings calls. Why are you doing that? And you did something totally new on Tuesday that you had never done before, in that you took Twitter questions from anyone out there. Sure. Um, well, I'm really lucky. My CFO is the most experienced CFO in tech. Ken Goldman has been a public company C CFO for 28 years. Uh, and frankly, I just was like, well, what can we do to make this more interesting for Ken? And I like to innovate. And I was like, you know, it's got to be boring, right? Like when you're doing your like 112th earning call or something like that. Uh, and so he said, you know, is there a way that we can, we can mix things up? I like to innovate. Like it was time to sort of change the format. Uh, for Ken, and we said, you know, we're Yahoo, we produce video content, you know, wh wouldn't it be better if we, you know, should we try something, we tried it for the first time in, in July, should we try video? And 
we really liked it. And it's not because it's, it's actually really quite stressful to be on camera and talk, be taking live questions. A lot of people ask us if we tape it beforehand and then just air it, and the answer is no. So like, whatever happens, happens. And so it is, it is quite stressful. But the really amazing thing it allows us to do is show our products and actually show the progress. So everything from animating charts as we're talking about those charts to showing the product refreshes. This past quarter, we did 15 major product refreshes and launches. So as I'm talking about them, to be able to show them on screen and really bring them to life is something that we think is really powerful. So that, that part worked well. Um, I think that you know, we wanted to try and, and do the Twitter and email questions this past time to get some, some participation, but also because we, it's sort of a bit of a funny system right now because we have a conference call running in the background where we take the questions, and then we've got the video the video webcast, and we were trying to figure out could we consolidate the two calls into one so we're not piping the phone call into the video call. Um, but, but the real essence of it is that a lot of times you want real-time questions mm -hmm. because the analysts are reacting to the content that you've, that you've talked about earlier in the call. And so I think that we're going to end up having to have that live call in line open because it's just too hard to get the good and mo the, the best and most relevant questions beforehand via Twitter or email. I see. So you think you're going to drop the Twitter idea? Yeah, and we'll see. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I said, we're innovating. We're trying out a new format. We wanted to try this. It was something new. But I overall think that the analyst questions were better, more topical, on, on point. And there is a real value of them getting to hear the release, hear the call, and then ask in response to that. Yeah. Keep on innovating. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa <laughs> Meyer. Thank you all. Don't leave the room, it's not over yet.